Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Leslie with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center, and I'm here with Ian Alden, a practicing attorney here in New Mexico, and he's going to be giving us a webinar on some really valuable information, buying a business, thinking about buying a business, and the process of buying a business. Here's how you finance it, which I think is super important. We all want to know because that's kind of seems like the basic step. So if you have questions, type them into the Q&A throughout the entire webinar because Ian's going to be picking them up and answering your questions. Ian, turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Leslie. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another great workshop. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about um, how to finance a business purchase. We'll get into what that looks like, what some of your different financing options are, uh, kind of do a pros and cons analysis of them. But before I jump into that, I want to go through a little bit of house cleaning. So as you can see on the slide, there's a lot of great resources here for employers, especially employers maintaining workspaces in the age of COVID-19. Uh, the Delta variant is still running amok throughout the land, and there's all kinds of new variants on the way. So it's more important now than ever to maintain a COVID safe workplace. So be sure to check out uh, some of the resources on the slide so that you can be doing your part to, like I said, maintain a COVID safe workplace and hopefully help put this pandemic behind us. Some other quick notes, uh, make sure your microphone stays muted. It should be muted by default, but if it ever comes unmuted for whatever reason, just keep yourself muted, um, unless you wanna ask a question, in which case you can use the raise your hand feature of Zoom here. And make sure your Zoom ratio is set to fit window. That's so you can see everything that's on the slides. We will be using the Q&A function to take questions, and I'm gonna be using that throughout the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end to ask your question. If you have a question, just throw it into the Q&A, and I'll usually get to the end of the slide, and then I'll look at what's in the Q&A and try and answer you in real time. But if you do want to hold your question to the end, that's fine too. Just make sure that you write down your question and the slide number that it relates to. You can see that slide number on the bottom right hand corner of the slide. That's just so that I know what to skip back to if we need to look something over again. Now the SPDC has a number of great um, workshops coming up that I'd highly recommend you have a look at. Uh, on the 10th, uh, there's Are You Tax Ready? looking at the Paycheck Protection Program, Economic Injury Disaster Loans, Employer Retention Tax Credit, uh, and the implications of all of that. If you claimed any or all of those, uh, you pr probably wanna have a look at this uh, workshop just to make sure that you're ready to deal with the reporting and whatnot that you have to do to make sure, for example, you get the PPP loans forgiven, uh, that you're reporting EIDL correctly to get the write-offs or deductions for that and so on. It's just um, really important to make sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's with all these tax incentives and stimulus programs. On the 13th, there's three steps to attracting and retaining customers, which um, everyone needs, especially nowadays. Um, 10 amazing online video ideas for your business coming up. And of course, there's basic steps to starting a business in New Mexico. If you're at that stage of your business where you need some help starting up and you need some guidance uh, to go in the right direction, definitely check that workshop out. Also, be sure to check out the other great resources the SBDC is offering. Uh, go to nmsbdc.org. They've got no-cost business counseling. They've got loan application assistance, which... Um, you're going to realize just how important and valuable that is once I start going into the material today. But really, there's a lot of great resources right at your fingertips with the NMSBDC. So be sure to check out their website and sign up for that. A few disclosures before we really get started. Um, all of this material is presented for informational purposes only. I'm not really providing you necessarily solutions to your individual problems or situations. Highly recommend chatting with your own professional advisors before you implement any planning strategies, before you apply for any loans or, you know, decide to move forward with a business purchase. Chat with your professional advisors who can advise you based on your unique situation. Um, similarly, you know, we're talking about financial concepts here. 
I'm not a licensed um, loan agent, broker, financial professional. I am a licensed attorney in the state of New Mexico. I specifically practice in mergers and acquisitions. I help folks buy and sell businesses all the time. But, um, you know, I'm not a financial professional. So um, I don't personally work with people throughout the loan process. So I'd highly recommend if you are going through it, reaching out, whether it's to your personal accountants or CPAs or attorneys or um, the SBDC. Again, they offer loan application assistance, which you might find very helpful. So we're going to talk about uh, a few things. We're going to look generally at what it's like to buy a business, uh, what different forms that can take because that kind of impacts how you might need financing in the first place. Then we're going to look at some of the, the big the big three, as I like to call it, forms of financing a uh, business purchase. And then uh, we're going to get creative and exploring some alternative means of financing. So we're going to cover that one by one, starting with just a basic introduction. Um, and, you know, the crux of this, this is why we're here at this workshop in the first place. Buying a business can be expensive. Um, and then this is a fun picture I found of someone getting paid under the table. Don't do that, but... You know, I was pulling from a limited list of Microsoft stock images, and this was one of two that had money. So buying a business can be expensive. Um, you probably already know that if you're here, um, depending on the value of what it is you're buying, you could be looking at, you know, I think the, the least expensive business sale I personally worked on was about $35,000. The most expensive I've worked on has been about $15 million. So it runs the gamut and I'm a small mid-sized business attorney. Obviously when you get into even larger business sales, we're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or more in some cases, I doubt that's where you're at. You know, if you're selling your business for a few hundred million dollars, congratulations. Uh, don't know if that really fits the small business model, but by and large, you're probably here because you want to have a better sense of how you can finance the purchase or sale of the business. So, you know, it goes without saying that it's expensive and that oftentimes buyers aren't going to have the entire purchase price available to them in liquid capital. Um, you know, liquid capital being cash. Sometimes it means uh, equivalent assets if the seller is willing to accept them in lieu of cash. But by and large, when you buy a business is in cash, whether that's cash on hand or financed amounts. Um, you know, buying a business, it can look like a number of different things. Uh, you can be buying a business from an unrelated seller in what would be called an arm's length transaction. So-and-so is selling their business. You're not an existing owner. You're not an employee of that business, but you see it and you want it. Maybe you know them uh, through someone else. Um, but the point is you want to buy the business. Maybe you're an employee of a business and your employer, your boss is looking to retire, or be bought out. And so you're purchasing the business for that reason. Or, you know, maybe you're a partner in a business venture and you want to buy out your partners, your, your other partners, that you are the sole owner. Um, the financing that I'm about to talk about here works by and large in all of these situations. And so uh, no matter what your position is with respect to the seller, of the business, these financing tips are gonna work for you. And we're gonna start with probably the biggest um, that I deal with with small businesses, which is SBA loans. SBA loans, uh, you know, the Small Business Administration, um, they are SBA backed loans. They're loans backed by the federal government, but typically extended through private lenders. And so what that means is the SBA is going to personally guarantee the loan to the private lender up to a certain percent, usually about 85%, depending on the type of loan. So the lender, the private lender, you know, your local bank or credit union or some larger outfits, they will extend a loan to you based on SBA underwriting standards. You know, the SBA says, in order for us to guarantee the loan, you have to check all of these boxes, make sure the borrower is credit worthy, the business is sound, et cetera. But assuming that the lender does that, the SBA will guarantee the loan so that, you know, if the lender doesn't get paid by the borrower, 
uh, they get paid what the guaranteed amount by the SBA. That's what makes those lenders more willing to extend credit, whereas otherwise they might have much more stringent underwriting standards. So that's that's what an SBA SBA loan really is. It's been, it's an SBA backed loan, and there's a handful of them. Depending on how much time we have at the end of the presentation, I might actually take you through the SBA website and the comparison of the different SBA loans above and beyond the three that I'm talking about here. But the three that I typically see, especially when we're talking about buying a business or you know, buying part of a business, um, we're talking about either the standard loan, the small loan, or what's getting increasingly popular is the express loan. So we're gonna cover those three and what they look like and what the differences are. But um, that's SBA loans in a nutshell. So we're gonna start with the standard loan because everything else with respect to 7A loans and just, you know, there, there's other types of SBA loans. There's the 7A loans, the 504 loans, micro loans, and then there's the purpose-driven ones. There's the Paycheck Protection Program loan, the Economic Injury Disaster loan that are more purpose-driven and don't really apply to buying a business. But there's a bunch of SBA loans out there. We're talking about 7A loans. Um, the name is derived from Section 7A of the Small Business Act that authorizes these loans in the first place. They're, again, they're government-backed loans issued by private lenders. Um, the private lenders first have to qualify with the SBA to extend these loans. Not every lender does. And you know, part of it is the SBA has to trust their private lending partners to make sure that those lenders aren't doing something underhanded like um, rubber stamping applicants to qualify for these SBA backed loans. That's historically been a problem in the past, especially with government backed mortgages. You all remember the 2008 financial crisis that was driven in large part by um, private lenders issuing government-backed um, loans to subprime candidates and rubber stamping those applications, giving loans to people who really shouldn't have qualified for them. So the SBA, um, you know, to be a private lender that can extend SBA guaranteed loans, the lender has to qualify with the SBA first. Um, and so just understand that if you want an SBA loan, not every lender is going to be able to offer them to you. So you'll have to find a lender that is authorized to extend them. Um, they have more lenient underwriting standards uh, than a lot of strict private financing, which we'll talk about later, just because they are government backed. Um, it's the same as again with mortgages. You know, you're, if you go and borrow from your local bank or credit union, you're typically borrowing through a government guaranteed program like um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, FHA, um, HUD, whatever. The point is um, there's a lot of government guarantees in the lending industry, both with these SBA loans and other types of loans. So that, that's why a lot of lenders are willing to do business with people they don't have an established relationship with, that they don't necessarily believe in the credit worthiness of. As long as you meet the SBA standards for the loan, you should be good. Some private lenders are still a bit more strict within certain limitations with their underwriting standards, but by and large, they're going by what the SBA tells them to do. So with that in mind, um, you can take out an SBA 7A loan for a number of purposes. They do have restrictions on what you can use the money for. Um, you can use the money for any number of authorized purposes, including long and short-term working capital. And by the way, I, I copied and pasted this list from the SBA website because this is straight from the horse's mouth. It's, it's kind of important to understand their perspective. And so this is what the SBA themselves are representing our authorized uses for the loan proceeds. Um, long and short-term working capital. So if you just need money to get through um, you know, you've got expenses that need to be paid before you have the income. Uh, that's what working capital functionally is. It's money that you can use to pay expenses before you have more revenue to replenish the working capital. So you can use it for that. You can use it for revolving funds based on value of existing inventory and receivables. Uh, you can use it for the purchase of equipment, machinery, furniture, fixtures, supplies, or materials. 
um, in furtherance of the business. You can use it for the purchase of real estate, including land and buildings. Um, you know, this is interesting because you can do that with a 7A loan to a degree. A lot of people, if they're just looking for real estate, might go with a different SBA loan, it's called a 504 loan. I don't know that we'll have time to really talk about that here, but just know that if your goal is to purchase real estate or improvements for your business, um, this isn't the only loan for you, but I'm talking about this one specifically because it can also be used for um, establishing a new business or acquiring an existing one. Um, you know, also constructing building, renovating a building, refinancing existing business debt to a degree, um, or the big reason we're talking about it here, establishing a new business or assisting in the acquisition, operation, or expansion of an existing business. Keyword there is acquisition. So some basic facts about um, the SBA 7A standard loans. The maximum loan amount is $5 million. And of that, the maximum SBA guarantee is 3.75 million. And what that means is, though this loan is SBA backed, the SBA doesn't have 100% risk of exposure here. If you were to borrow $5 million under a 7A loan, and then you just default the next day, which, you know, obviously that's not going to work for a number of reasons, but if you did, um, the lender, the private lender that extended the loan could go to the SBA and the SBA would put up 3.75 million. Um, that is the maximum that they're willing to guarantee, which means the private lender will be on the hook for the remaining mill and a quarter, which means that they have skin in the game, which means that they are going to make sure that you are credit worthy to their satisfaction as well as the SBAs before they'll issue you a loan especially if we're talking high dollar figures and the SBA is only guaranteeing up to, I think it was 75 or 80% of it. Um, I think 75% based on the math there. So just understand that you're still dealing with two sets of underwriting standards ultimately. Um, and you know either can be stricter, but it has to be at least as strict as the SBA's requirements. The maximum maturity, that's how long you have to repay the loan is up to 25 years, but that varies a lot depending on the use of loan proceeds. Because if we're talking for real estate, I think it's up to 25 years for certain other things between five, seven or 10 years, like um, purchase of uh, business assets and equipment and things like that, I believe that's 10 years. So the maturity, which is the amount of time you have to repay the loan, can really vary depending on the use of the loan proceeds. And that's going to be established at the time the loan is underwritten and issued. Um, they'll figure out what the maximum maturity is. The interest rate, it's negotiable by the lender up to the SBA maximum. So the SBA sets a cap, a maximum interest rate that can vary or fluctuate for the SBA-backed loan. Uh, one last I checked to somewhere in the ballpark of 9% maximum, but it, it tends to change. So you want to make sure that you know what the latest up-to-date um, interest rate cap is, but the lender can negotiate the interest up to that cap. There's also a floor that has to be charged. So between the floor and the cap, they can negotiate. Collateral. Is there collateral required? Um, yes. For loans above $25,000, collateral is required. For loans above, I think it was $350,000, the SBA requires that the lender maximize the collateralization of assets by going after and securing as collateral any assets of the business being purchased, as well as possibly some personal assets of the principal, uh, the principal being the owner of the business. And just you may not be familiar with the concept. I talked about it in other workshops and webinars, but when I say collateral, is collateral required? We're talking um, security, you know, assets that the lender can go after in the event you default on the loan. So if you take out the loan and then walk away, they can go after the, the business, its assets, its bank account. They might be able to go after you personally and your assets. I mean, they typically have you sign a personal guarantee which is you saying, if the, you know, if the business or the borrower defaults on the loan, I will personally pay it. So you're probably gonna be personally on the hook for the loan as well. It might be able to go after your house and other assets, but that's what I mean by collateral. 
and it is required in, with SBA loans above a certain dollar amount. Turnaround time to process these loans, they say five to 10 business days. As a practical matter, just getting the application done and getting everything um, in a state where it can be submitted for underwriting and processing, it's gonna take you a lot longer than five to 10 business days. Um, as we'll go through in a little bit, there's a lot of stuff that you'll have to gather and provide in order to qualify for the loan in the first place in order to put your application in. Um, so that's kind of a quick fact sheet. Now to qualify for an SBA 7A loan, there is a few basic requirements here put out by the SBA. Um, you, the business has to operate for profit. This can't be a nonprofit endeavor. This can't be something other than a for-profit business venture. It has to be considered a small business as defined by the SBA. Uh, small business has uh, a lot of conditions to it, but it all boils down to financially, like the size of the business, its revenue, um, number of employees it has, uh, it has to qualify as a small business because, again, we're talking a small business administration loan. If you are a something other than a small business, you're probably going to be looking at more private financing, which uh, I'll talk about after the SBA loans. But um, really, you have to be a small business for an SBA loan. You have to be engaged in or going to be engaged in business in the United States or it's possessions, as they call it, which we're talking um, territories uh, and whatnot. Think um, Puerto Rico um, or uh, Guam, for example, uh, you know, territories of the United States. Uh, you have to be doing business within those. Uh, you have to have reasonable invested equity, um, which I like to call skin in the game. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, but you have to have some personal skin in the game because the SBA is not going to, for example, they're not going to finance 100% of a business purchase. They're not going to finance 100% of anything. Typically, you have to put in what's called an infusion of equity. You have to show that you've got skin in the game. You need to be able to demonstrate a need for a loan, which means you can't have, you know, you can't say, I need a loan to buy this thing for a million dollars and then have $3 million sitting in the bank. Um, then you don't really need the loan. Maybe you're trying to take out the loan because interest rates are so low. And, you know, with time, you know, present value of money in your hand, you want to take out a loan, but you have to show you need it. You have to use the funds for a sound business purpose. And this is, this is a really interesting one because this gets into things like business plan, projections, your intended use of the funds. You can't take out a loan for some um, wild speculation or for, for some other use unrelated to the business. It has to actually line up with the business purpose. You can't be delinquent on any existing debt obligations to the US government. Um, you know, people ask me what this really means, and like taxes, uh, typically student loans, existing SBA loans. Uh, you, I've, I've had people ask me, you know, I'm, I'm in default on my existing SBA loan. Can I take out another one? And the answer is almost always no. Uh, I'm never going to tell someone definitively no, because that's ultimately between you and the lender. But I've never seen someone able to refinance a defaulted loan into a current loan. You typically have to get current first, and even then, um, they're going to be really wary of extending another loan to you if you're in default on the last one. Uh, you can't be an ineligible business as defined by the SBA. And if we have time, I'll pull up the list of ineligible businesses because there's actually a number of industries that are considered ineligible. Um, certain financial services, gambling, real estate speculation. Uh, there's a handful of them that the SBA just doesn't want to touch. Um, and, and I'm, I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure all the state legal marijuana businesses are falling into that category as well. I'd have to double check that. I really haven't looked lately. But um, yeah, that's some of the basic requirements, but there's more than that. Um, as a matter of practice, and these aren't hard and fast rules, but as a matter of practice, um, the business needs to demonstrate and some of these are hard and fast rules. Fewer than 500 employees typically, less than seven and a half million dollars average revenue in the prior three years. Uh, you need to show that you're not bringing in um, money that moves you out of the categorization of being a small business. If you've got more than 500 employees, if you've got 
um, more than seven and a half mil average revenue in the previous three years, you might not be a small business under the SBA guidelines. Uh, for the principal, the owner of the business, you need to show net income under $5 million, um, tangible net worth less than 15 million. You want to show a good credit score, ideally 680 or above. Uh, you know, it's you need to be able to show that you're credit worthy in order to take out any loan or not just private lender financing or SBA loans, but any loan. That's the thing. I mean, there's subprime lending, but that has all kinds of conditions attached. It's not something that can really cover here. We're talking about, um, you know, authentic loan products. Um, no recent bankruptcies, foreclosures or tax liens. I believe that's within the last three years. They consider recent, but um, depending on the lender, the private lender, they may extend that further. Um, you want to show two years of business history for a business you're acquiring, um, the ability to provide collateral for loans above 25,000, the ability to make a required down payment for the loan, typically at least $10,000 or 10% of the loan amount. I mean, there's, there's, you want to be able to show that you can provide that infusion of equity and that you are able to put your own skin in the game. Because if you don't have any personal working capital, any cash to spend on the, the business, you're not going to get the loan. Um, they require that you have um, that. They also want to see sufficient cash flow and working capital. Um, you know, you want to be able to show that uh, the business isn't defunct, that you've got working capital to work with, that it's not already insolvent, that it's got good cash flow, that there's money coming in, and that it's a, a functioning business. And then there's the good character requirement, which is um, it's a very broad concept, but I just like to frame it as no felonies, and you have to be able to um, explain away misdemeanors. So if you've got misdemeanors from when you were younger, maybe, or um, something that's pretty innocuous. You just want to be able to explain those away to the satisfaction of the lender. Felonies, I've honestly never seen someone push to get their SBA loan application through with felonies on their records. But then again, I'm not a lender, so I really can't speak to whether or not that's um, prohibitive in all cases, but just know that they do look at that as a consideration. And especially one thing in any loan product that I've seen be pretty darn disqualifying for people is um, uh, crimes of moral turpitude and financial crimes, financial malfeasance, um, things like that, embezzlement, theft, uh, those make it very hard to convince any lender to extend credit to you in this situation. So. Just expect when you're going through the loan application that stuff like that's going to come up. A lot of people don't really think about it until they're midway through the process. Yeah. Now, in order to obtain an, a 7A loan from the SBA, you're going to be expected to provide a number of things. And like I said, if I have time, I'll go through some of this in more detail. But this is where we really get into, oh my gosh, I've got to provide a lot. And this is actually two pages of stuff. Um, what do I do here? And don't freak out looking at this list. Um, you shouldn't anyway. It's actually not as daunting as it might look at first, but um, there's loan application assistance out there, including through the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. The NMSBDC offers loan application assistance where they will help small business owners through the process of, uh, you know, completing the checklist of things they need to submit. Um, they can help you with things like um, your um, business plan um, that you'll need to provide and show your intention to use the loan funds for. So really, there's options out there to help you through the process. There's also, of course, your own private professional advisors and counselors, uh, CPAs, for example. A lot of folks lean on their CPAs to help them with this process. Uh, as a, an attorney, I don't really deal with this so much. This is more nuts and bolts that are done between the business owner and their accountant, but just know that you have options for assistance. But what you're going to need to provide to obtain a 7A loan, um, there's a few SBA forms, um, the borrower information forms, the basic one, statement of personal history, and personal financial statement. Now, this is, uh, you know, those three are meant to help the lender assess you as an applicant. So they get to know you, 
your own credit worthiness, your own situation before they start diving into the nuts and bolts of the business itself. Because like I said, sometimes there's something with you personally uh, as the owner of the business that's going to be disqualifying from a lending standpoint. So they're gonna gather those three forms, but then the other parts of a loan application that needs to be submitted in order for the loan to truly be processed and underwritten um, you need the business financial statements, uh, which include P&Ls, profits and loss statements, current within the last six months of your application, um, plus supplementary schedules from the last three years. Um, you'll need um, projected financial statements, uh, including one-year projection of income and finances and the plans for achieving those projections. So it's not just saying, I'm going to make a million dollars. You actually have to kind of show what the basis of that projection is and how you intend to reach it. Um, there's the ownership and affiliations. You need to disclose kind of the, the subsidiaries, the affiliate businesses, going concerns that you are the owner of or that you have a controlling interest of or that are connected to you or the business. I mean, there, there has to, the SBA wants to know, as do the lenders, who they're dealing with, both as in terms of the business owners and the business itself. There's the loan application history, including any loans you may have applied for in the past, which is important for a number of reasons, but it's also important because you need to show that um, other forms of financing aren't available to you for an, a 7A loan, which means, um, you know, typically that might mean you've applied for private financing and have been rejected and steered towards the SBA loan product. So they want to see your loan application history. They want to see um, personal and business federal income tax returns for the business principles for the last three years. They want to see the tax returns. They want to see, uh, for one, that they've been filed, but they also want to see the figures on them to make sure that they line up with expectations, that they show satisfactory income, and that they can be reconciled with the other information that's been provided. One of the biggest holdups in loan applications that I see is mismatches where what's on the P&Ls, what's on the other financial disclosures does not line up with what's on the tax returns. Sometimes there's an explanation for that. Sometimes the explanation is we did the tax returns wrong, in which case you might need to go fix those, but they want to see the tax returns. They also want to see resumes for each principal owner of the business. Um, they want to see um, business overview and history. They, they, they kind of want an explanation of the business to know who it is they're lending to or what it is they're lending for. They want to see the lease or proposed lease from the business's landlord. Uh, they want to see the balance sheets, profits and loss statements. They want to see federal income tax returns for the previous three years. Um, you know, we covered some of that already. They, they want to see the proposed bill of sale, including the terms of sale. Um, the asking price with the schedule of inventory, machinery, equipment, and other assets. Um, they want to see other agreements that are pertinent, for example, with franchises. There's always a franchise agreement in place with the franchisee. Um, you know, that has a number of implications. The SBA typically wants to see that the franchise fee has been paid before they'll extend the loan, before they'll fund it. Um, so they want to see that all of that is sorted. I'll tell you now, lenders are pretty leery of franchise scenarios because franchisors wield an outsized power over their franchisees, including the ability to pull the rug out from under their franchisees, often for very arbitrary or capricious reasons. So lenders are very leery of dealing with franchises, but that doesn't automatically disqualify you, though they do want to see the franchise agreement they want to see licensing agreements, et cetera. They want to see if the franchise fee has been paid. They want to see that you're still in good standing with the franchise. And then lastly, they want to see the proof of equity injection, which can basically mean showing that you've got the money in the case of buying a business to provide as a down payment. So, you know, obviously you're not going to put money into the business before you own it, but they want to see that you have the money there to provide as part of the down payment and equity injection. They want to see that you can put the money in and have working capital left over. So they, they want to know that they're not lending to something that's going to be automatically insolvent. So there's a lot of back and forth that's going to go on as to exactly what that looks like in each purchase scenario. But just know that these are all requirements that you're going to have to meet uh, when you apply for the loan. 
There's other kinds of 7A loans. Um, there's small loans, which are um, kind of a, a, a smaller subset of SBA loans. They tend to be a little bit easier to apply for. Um, smaller loan amounts, 350,000 uh, maximum loan amount. SBA will guarantee up to 315,000 of that. Same maturity and whatnot. Um, they're just, think of it as a smaller S7A loan, which sounds great, but really where people are being steered to now for smaller loan products is 7A express loans. Um, express loans, these are interesting in part because they've been so impacted by COVID-19 and the stimulus measures. Um, you know, they used to be kind of the same as small loans. They had a maximum loan amount of 350 thou, um, similar guarantee of 315 thou. Um, interest rates negotiable, maturity is what it is. Uh, the big advantage to it was that um, uh, no collateral required necessarily. The SBA turnaround time was like 36 hours to process and as opposed to five to 10 business days. And eligibility for the express loans was determined by the lender instead of the SBA. So um, this was something that private lenders had a bit more control over. But in light of COVID-19, Congress expanded the scope of these express loans to $1 million with the $500,000 um, guarantee. Um, they expanded that through October, like into October of this year. Uh, and then they dropped that back down to 500,000 uh, slash 250,000 permanently. So express loans, uh, the takeaway from this is they're quicker to process than your traditional 7A loans. Um, the application process is driven a bit more by the private lender. Uh, you know, the maximum loan amount is larger than 7A small loans. So they're, they're, they're streamlined is the idea. If you don't need the entirety of a 7A loan, you might be able to do with the 7A express loan. And that's something to talk about with your lender or again with the SBDC in counseling with them or your other professional advisor. But an express loan might be the way to go depending on your intended loan uses and the amount you actually need. So that's SBA loans in a nutshell. And obviously those are, those are the big ones. Um, you know, as a small business attorney that deals a lot with M&A, um, I mostly see seller financing, which we'll talk about here shortly, but apart from seller financing, every other loan that I see typically is SBA backed. I very rarely see private lender financing that is not an SBA backed loan product, uh, which is actually quite, self-explanatory in a way. Um, private lender financing is in one sense self-explanatory. It, it, it's financing from a bank, credit union, or other private institution that is not an SBA-backed loan product. So this is a direct loan from the bank or other financial institution to you as the borrower. Um, they extend them uh, and there are reasons why people take them out. Um, private lenders, um, you know, there's some pros and cons to it. They typically have higher lending and underwriting standards, but they also have fewer borrowing limits, fewer restrictions on how the funds can be used and less red tape. There's one less party at the table. There's one less stakeholder with a say in how the loan is gonna be extended and used. So private financing is actually quite helpful um, in a sense, depending on what your needs are but it's not terribly common for small business acquisitions um, because typically if I'm a private lender and someone asks me for a loan of $2 million, do I want to extend them a loan that I'm 100% on the hook for or a loan that the SBA is going to guarantee um, in the event that the borrower defaults? If I'm the lender, I want to make use of the SBA loan program because that protects me to the greatest extent possible. So it's, an option, it's out there. Uh, it's not terribly common in business acquisitions at the at small business level. But um, you may have to ask because again, one feature of the SBA loans is that you have to demonstrate an inability to get financing through other means, which could involve a showing that you can't obtain credit or a loan through a private lender, at least not to the degree you need. 
So you may need to go through that process as part of ultimately obtaining an SBA loan. So that's private lender financing in a nutshell. And here's a basic example of it. Um, you know, Eduardo is looking to buy a professional services firm from Elaine for six mil. Um, he applies with his bank for a private loan sufficient to cover the purchase price. Um, you know, six mil is above the threshold, it's above the cap for a 7A loan. So um, he's going with the private financing option. He's got excellent credit. Uh, the firm being acquired has solid financials. The bank is satisfied. You know, there's lots of collateral being put up to secure the loan. So the bank says, okay, we'll do it. Um, it's going to need to be a significant down payment and capital injection, personal guarantees, loan, pledge of personal assets from Eduardo. I mean, the, the, the bank is going to want to maximize their security, their collateral, their protection. But, you know, that's how a private loan works. Um, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to an SBA loan, not the least because they're both extended ultimately by private lenders, but also just because the SBA doesn't want to lose their investment either. The government, despite popular belief, isn't just throwing money at people and saying, Merry Christmas. It's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of underwriting and um, due diligence done on the part of the SBA and the lender because everyone wants to make sure that they're going to get paid. In the end, it's the same with private lender financing only to the nth degree because there's less security for the lender. So that being the case, the SBA loans are very popular, but what if you don't qualify for an SBA loan? Maybe you, um, you're not, you don't have the credit worthiness. Maybe you've had some bad luck with federal loans in the past. Maybe you're in default or been delinquent, maybe you know, whatever the reason you can't qualify for that SBA loan, but you still want to buy the business and the seller still wants to sell it to you. What do you do there? Seller financing. Um, it's basically a loan between the seller and the buyer of all or part of the purchase price. So the seller is going to agree, okay, I'm giving you the business now. Like you take ownership as of closing, but you are going to owe me this money that you will have to pay over time, whether in equal monthly installments or some monthly installments with a balloon payment, however you want to do it, that's seller financing. The buyer is paying the, lend the, the seller over time and the seller is essentially a lender in that situation. So there's a purchase agreement for the purchase of the business. And along with that, there's typically a promissory note that is just the debt instrument by which the buyer is promising to pay the seller. There's a loan agreement, usually. Um, a lot of times that's worked into the purchase agreement, but that, that sets the standards for the loan and the intended use of the proceeds. So it's, you know, the note's a basic debt instrument, but the loan agreement says buyer is going to use this money uh, for the purchase price. They're going to get this money and it's immediately going to the seller without ever really touching the buyer, et cetera. That's all spelled out in the loan agreement. There's a security agreement um, to collateralize the loan, which means typically if I'm, if the seller is financing the purchase of a business, um, the seller is going to have an ongoing security interest in the assets of that business until the loan is repaid. That's a pretty standard ask uh, that can either be in a separate security agreement, or oftentimes that's just tacked onto the promissory note. And then lastly, there can be a personal guarantee, which is I, the owner of the, the business, you know, the buying entity, I'm going to ultimately own the business once I buy it. I will personally guarantee the loan in case the business fails. That's incredibly common with seller financing. And really, it's as straightforward as it sounds there. The buyer is going to pay the seller over time for all or some of the purchase price. Typically, um, you know, typically the buyer is going to pay something as a down payment, 10%, 20%, 50%, whatever. It's negotiable between the buyer and the seller. There's no set requirements here, except there is one that I can point to. Well, there, there's a few, actually. The, the terms of the financing can't be usurious, meaning they can't run afoul of the usury laws that regulate lending in the state. Um, so you can't have outrageous burdensome loan terms that violate the law. Um, you can't have excessive interest. That would be usurious. Um, and, you know, in New Mexico, there's a big outstanding question of what that looks like for business transactions, but 
don't go nuts with it. You also have to charge at least some interest as the seller, uh, at least the applicable federal rate in place at the time the sale happens. Uh, if you don't charge at least that much in interest and work that into the promissory note, the IRS will treat the seller as having received that interest and will tax them on it anyway. So you have to have at least a minimum interest amount. But otherwise, everything is really negotiable between the buyer and the seller here. So whereas SBA loans and private lender financing can be kind of arduous, uh, and a lot of people may not qualify for one reason or another, seller financing is how these businesses actually change hands when loans aren't an option. They are the most common form of purchase price financing I see in my practice. Because again, you know, there's all kinds of disqualifiers for loans. So seller financing is what a lot of folks do to bridge that gap. And really it's, it's just a handy means of getting these things done quickly, especially if the parties are on relatively good terms with one another, if they're friendly with one another, um, you, you know, it's, especially if you're buying the business from someone you've known for a long time, or maybe it's your employer, um, in situations like that, especially, um, it's going to be really hard to get a loan, not impossible, but really hard. So seller financing might be the way to go there. It's not the only option. We're going to explore a few alternatives in just a minute here, but uh, it's very common and very easy to work with. But obviously that puts the seller at risk if the buyer defaults, if the business fails, um, you know, if the buyer disappears into the wind, the seller isn't getting the money that they expected to get. So sellers, you know, if I'm a seller, I would prefer if at all possible that the buyer get a loan or at least that they prepay as much of the purchase price as possible. Um, also know that these things are not mutually exclusive of one another. I have seen this done where, the buyer puts a down payment in, they get an SBA loan or other financing for the majority of the purchase price, but they still use some seller financing to bridge the gap to cover the rest of the purchase price. I have seen that done. It is tricky, but you can thread that needle. So um, just know that these aren't mutually exclusive and you have a number of options to work with here. Um, as an example of seller financing, um, Pam wants to buy the machine shop from Eric. Uh, they've agreed on a 500,000 purchase price, but Pam can only get 200,000 in lender financing and she can only pay $50,000 as a down payment. So there's 250,000 left. What do they do here? Um, Eric's going to extend seller financing through remaining 250,000, which means Pam's going to execute a promissory note to Eric for that 250,000. Um, with the terms of the loan and the note and in the business purchase agreement. Um, she'll pledge the assets of the machine shop as collateral. Um, she may sign a personal guarantee, but maybe she doesn't have to here, which would be great because as a buyer, personal guarantees are terrible. It puts you at maximum risk of exposure if uh, the business fails. So that's an example of seller financing. And, you know, it... It is straightforward if you're thinking, wow, what am I missing here? It's meant to be straightforward, but just understand that it is the terms of seller financing are very much negotiable. So be sure that you're negotiating that well. I did a webinar not too long ago about negotiating win-win contracts and some negotiation strategies, which includes buying and selling a business. So uh, you might refer back to that. Uh, it should be posted online on the SBDC's website or on YouTube. Um, but there's a lot of negotiation that happens with these business purchases, obviously. Um, but then, you know, what happens if the seller doesn't want to do that? Or maybe the seller isn't offering terms that the buyer can accept. Does that scuttle the deal? Not necessarily. Understand that one of the biggest reasons business transactions fail, and I say this as a, a transactional attorney, is lack of creativity. And I don't say that to be demeaning. It's just the honest truth is a lot of people box themselves in with an expectation that, you know, if I can't do it through a standard loan, I can't do it. Or if the seller isn't going to finance on these exact terms, we can't do it. Um, there's always alternatives if both parties are willing to explore them. And this is a fun one. Um, you know, there's, you know, I'm going to explore one right here with you. That's a fun concept of alternative financing that I did 
pretty recently, and I actually do a variation of this pretty commonly for um, business bias, but I'm going to cover this and one other. Um, Jim has worked for Alice's business for nearly a decade. Alice is planning to retire in five years. Um, she and Jim both want for Jim to buy the business. Um, Alice doesn't want to sell it to her kids or leave it to her kids. She doesn't want to keep managing it after the fact. She wants out and she wants money. But she also doesn't want to sell her finance. She doesn't want to be getting paid over time with the risk that she's not going to get paid if Jim runs the business into the ground. And Jim can't qualify for lender financing because... Um, for one reason or another, maybe it's a credit thing. Maybe he hasn't demonstrated to the lender's satisfaction that he's got the management experience to really take this business and run with it. So they're going to get creative here. They're going to set a target purchase price now. Um, they're going to agree on a purchase price based on whatever the business is worth today. Um, they're going to negotiate a purchase agreement that they're going to sign today. And then they're going to agree that as part of the the um, purchase agreement, Jim is going to defer a portion of his salary every month into an escrow account, literally 1 60th of the purchase price every month into an escrow account. Um, if Jim leaves the company um, before the five year period ends, because you know Alice wants to retire after five years. If Jim leaves before the five year period ends, what Jim has had deferred and paid into escrow gets paid back out to him. He walks away. Um, the purchase fails, he doesn't get the company. But if Jim sticks around for the five years, um, over that course of the five years, he's going to have had all of the purchase price paid into escrow, you know, withheld from his salary over the previous five years. The escrowed funds will get paid out to Alice. That satisfies the purchase price. The closing happens right then and there. Jim owns the business outright, and Alice gets to walk away and retire. There's no debt. In this case, there's no loan, whether to Alice or to, or, you know, extended by a private lender. There's no SBA financing. This is a sort of financing that's, I, I refer to it as the layaway option because it really is layaway. You are paying a portion of the purchase price every month for five years. And at the end, you get the thing that you were prepaying. And this is an option that works for people if they're planning their retirement out a long ways in advance. There can be some hiccups that you have to plan for. For example, if Alice's health took a turn for the worst in year three, what happens? Um, you know, there's contingencies you want to think about and work into the purchase agreement. But in this situation, it worked for both of them. So you can get creative here. You don't need debt to finance a business purchase, is I guess where I'm going here. Um, and then there's another option. I'm not sure if I did a slide for it. Um, I did do a slide for this one, but before I get to this one, I want to cover a variation of this theme here, which is an employer buyout. Um, let's say, um, you know, same situation, but Alice wants to retire now, not in five years. Jim doesn't have the money to pay her now, um, and Jim just isn't going to be able to get that money through a loan or otherwise. There is a form of seller financing unique to um, you know, owner buyouts where an owner wants to retire. And the way that works is um, the owner will transfer, whether through a sale or a gift or whatever, some shares or units of their company to their employee, uh, Jim in this case. So Alan is going to get, Alice is going to give Jim like 5% um, uh, of the company's gift. And then Alice is going to enter an agreement with her own company whereby the company is going to buy her out in exchange for payments over the next few years. So it's actually not an agreement between Alice and Jim at all. Alice has an agreement with her own company whereby she's out and the company will pay her over time. So then all of a sudden, Jim is the ultimate owner of the company. Uh, Jim and the company have to pay Alice over time. It's like seller financing, but it's something kind of unique to employer buyouts. So the, the point I'm trying to make here, you can be creative and there's a number of ways of doing this sort of thing. There's a number of ways in each different form of business purchase to make it happen. And this is one that you see a lot in larger business purchases, not so much small businesses, but um, you see this a lot in corporate mergers. And I'm just gonna talk about it because I've been asked to make this work for small businesses and I did. 
and you can. Um, it's an option if you want to leave, like, like if, if you want to become more hands off with your company, if you want to sell it, but you're not going to get cash for it, or maybe you don't want cash for it right now, but you want to hand it off to someone who's going to take it and run with it and grow it and maybe give you an investment at the same time, consider this method. Um, Rick owns a software company. It's growing. It's fairly large, but it's, it's also a little cash poor. He wants to buy a smaller rival, um, but he lacks the working capital. He lacks the, the liquid capital to pay the $2 million purchase price for a smaller rival. He is going to offer the seller shareholders to buy their shares in exchange for stock in Rick's own company worth collectively what the seller shareholders own shares were worth. So in exchange for their shares in the selling company, they're going to get shares of Rick's company, which will afterwards own the selling company. It, it's a form of acquisition whereby the seller gets stock in exchange for their own company. So that company continues to exist as, as a subsidiary of Rick's company. Um, and all the seller shareholders suddenly own whatever the percent is of Rick's company. So they have to trust in that situation that Rick's, um, you know, that risk, Rick's company is going to do well, that the company they're selling is going to do well, that, um, you know, they're treating this more as an investment than a sale necessarily, but functionally it is a sale. There's no debt here. There's no financing here. It's just a targeted acquisition. So, you know, you can get creative in a number of different ways. This is one of them. This is, I like to re refer to this as kind of the, the joining forces approach because all of a sudden you've got two companies under one. End of the day, you really need to utilize your resources because every business owner situation is unique to them, everyone. I mean, every single one. And that is especially the case when we're talking about, for example, uh, lender financing, SBA financing. I went through you know, the list of things you're gonna have to provide in order to qualify for a loan. Everyone's situation is different there. So work with knowledgeable professionals who can help you with your financial planning, your loan applications, and really help you dot your I's and cross your T's and get this right the first time because one of the worst things that I see happen in my own practice is, you know, a purchase agreement's been carefully negotiated between the parties and, um, you know, everything's just waiting on financing and then financing falls through because of some minor technical error. And then that has to get fixed and resubmitted to underwriting. And all of a sudden the closing on the business sale has to get pushed back sometimes weeks or longer for the loan to be reevaluated. And so really, if you're, especially if you're operating on some kind of a, an important time frame, it's important to get this done right the first time. So reach out. I'd highly recommend reaching out to the Small Business Development Center, nmsbdc.org, set up a no-cost counseling session. Um, like I said, they can help you to some degree with loan application assistance and make sure that you are um, understanding the checklist and the things you need to submit to qualify for these loans. And frankly, you know, I gave you a broad overview of the loan and the requirements and standards, it's like a 30,000 foot overview, but the NMSBDC can give you much more detailed information or they can point you in the right direction. So work with your qualified professionals uh, who can help you to, to figure this out, whether it's again, a loan or some other means of financing your business acquisition. Do I have any questions from anyone? You know, I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A or raise your hand if you've got any. Um, we're just about out of time, but I wanna make sure that no one is holding on to anything they wanna get out there. And we, we are just about out of time, I know, Ian. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that we have a whole series of webinars, something for your small business. Um, I also wanna thank Ian for today's webinar. If you have questions and you think about it, we're gonna send you the slides, but if you have questions you think about it, email me and I'll make sure you do have a question coming in. 
but I will also make sure that we get your questions answered in the future. Oh, questions are coming in. Ian, do you want to take a look? Absolutely. Um, do I recommend any grants um, and talk about a mezzanine loan? So I've got a few questions in here. Do I recommend any grants or a direct uh, that I can direct you to? I don't have any specific recommendations for grants, especially when it comes to acquiring a business. You know, grants are a great resource for businesses, whether they're struggling or some business assistance grants um, and financial assistance whether provided by uh, the federal government, the state government, city, locality, or other nonprofits. I mean, grants are a great resource for businesses who are needing help or are looking to expand in a specific direction. Um, I don't have any ones that I'd recommend for buying a business, unfortunately. Um, and then the other question, talk about a mezzanine loan. Uh, I'm, that's actually a bit outside the scope of what I can talk about today. I'm really not sure how much I could get into on one. Um, and I don't really have much time, unfortunately, but um, again, in this, to know more about it, I recommend reaching out, doing that no cost business counseling assistance or, um, you know, reaching out to me after the seminar. I'm sure I could point you in the right direction with respect to that. Or, you know, like I said, um, your lender of choice or other professional advisor can help you with that. That is all the questions, and I think we're out of time. Well, thank you all so much for attending today, and uh, it's been it's been great. You'll have a great rest of your day. You guys have a great rest of your day. See you next time. Bye.